hungry trilobite podcast would like to start by acknowledging these fine conventions. SoonerCon. Oklahoma's longest-running pop culture convention is ready to return in 2023. SoonerCon 31 will be held in Norman, Oklahoma on June 30th through July 2nd, 2023. Gaming, cosplay, autographs, and an art auction await. Visit SoonerCon.com for more details. The Hellmouth Convention, where fandoms bleed together. Evoking the center of the mystical convergence, our event includes fandoms and travelers from all over the world. Like the Hellmouth itself, things gravitate toward it that you might not find elsewhere. The celebration is scheduled for June 9th through 11th, 2023 in Los Angeles, California. Go to thehellmouth.org to plan your visit. On tap today, we have Amelia Eichler. How are you doing this fine morning? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing good. I found your work through Twitter, and I was really, really excited when I found out that somebody had written a thesis on the importance of physical media in the age of streaming. And I was really surprised that somebody had written that when, I mean, when when we have so many people focusing on the exact opposite conclusion that physical media is not important, it was called not important 10 years ago, and you're coming in at the last minute saying, this is hugely important. Yeah, so I definitely was surrounded at the time when I wrote it by people who thought similarly as me. And so I was coming from where I already kind of felt that way and was like supported by other people who felt that way to some extent, maybe not like as passionately to write like a 50 page thesis as me, but I definitely, especially in film school and there's no focus on physical media, which I understand, you know, the ideas that you're teaching about like the future and what that's gonna look like and preparing students so that they're able to navigate like whatever technology is being thrown at them and film isn't necessarily something that is being thrown at them but I just feel like with everything changing and technology and looking at the past especially with changing technology it just seems like streaming is so different than what we've experienced in the past. You know, usually it's just changing the format, the aspect ratio, the sound type, you know, maybe it's on a disc or maybe it's on a tape, but it's still something physically that we have and we can hold and we can see that it's real. And I think with streaming, there's just a lack of control that we have as people who consume that media like that has been taken away from us. And I think it's a lot more dangerous is maybe a strong word, but it's something that I think people don't see as dangerous when it actually really is. It is, and this is something I definitely read when I looked through your paper, and I know that you're understanding this, but we know somebody in your position who's studying film, getting your, your undergrad, I assume, yeah. Okay. Um, and you're learning from the masters, you're learning from the greats of the past century, and you're learning it because you have the physical media to go back to the tapes, the film reels, the DVDs. When you're streaming, you're limited to learning from just what the studios consider to be valuable right now, which is very seldom what you should be learning as a historian. Yeah. And, you know, we've, as like my research has shown, you know, I don't talk about this as much in my thesis, but with every new form of physical, even physical media, it's like there's certain films that get lost. They don't get restored. You know, they don't get like saved. So when things switched to tape, you know, there was again, studios saying, well, I want these films on tape. And some films that were on film didn't get transed over, trans, transferred over or moved over to that new media. And so with streaming, like you said, a lot of it's curated. You know, we're constantly being thrown curation from different studios or different streaming services as what they deem is important and what should be consumed. And a lot of times they don't have what I'm looking for because I'm looking for 
something very obscure or something that's been overlooked. And I think that a lot of people I've heard say, well, streaming is giving people a lot of more access. And I can see why it looks that way because it's convenient. You know, convenience doesn't actually equal access. It's very different. Convenience is like, I can get on my laptop and find a movie in like five seconds. That doesn't mean that I have access to it and it doesn't mean that I have control over how I'm gonna consume it. Uh, if you're looking at the danger of a movie disappearing, mm -hmm. I would actually make the argument that streaming is more dangerous mm -hmm. because in the age when you had a physical print run of a movie, even if that was a small run, even if it went out of print, the the copies that were made were still there forever. You might you can go find them. It might be expensive. It might be a pain in the ass, but it can be done. But with streaming, once that contract ends, it's like it was never there in the first place. Somebody who yeah. wants a movie on Tuesday that went out of production on Monday, it's just like that was never there. That's that's really not even an argument for access in my mind. Yeah, and I think we're finding that now. Like I'm finding a lot more discourse on the internet right now about people being like, wait, you know, when something is, especially with newer shows, you know, I'm finding at my job, like professors are requesting media that hasn't even been, you know, made to order on DVD or Blu-ray or Blu-ray HD or all the different disc formats. And we can't give that to them and they can't access it because they don't have like that subscription or, you know, that film has disappeared. And I think we're finding that with shows that are coming out and just being put on a streaming platform and not being released on any other media, as soon as the studio decides that it's not viable and it's not getting the traction that they wanted or they don't see any value in that product, they're just gonna rip it. And like you said, it's almost like it never existed, which is actually pretty frightening, especially for the people who put a lot of hard work into those films and work really hard to make something that they believe in just to have that ripped and like have all their fans like not have access to that anymore is actually really frightening. And I'm frustrated because when I see this, when I hear what you're talking about in your paper and, and you outlined this very clearly, this is not something that they should be surprised by. This is a trend that started at least 20 years ago, because I remember these exact same discussions happening in the early days of DVD when there were ideas like DivX, which originally was not a codec. It was actually a, basically a pay-per-view version of DVD and mm -hmm. FlexPlay, which were self-destructing DVDs. And even the very early versions of video on demand were pitched as being eternally pay-per-view systems. It's like the studios have always wanted a, a service where you paid every time you touch the media and they finally have it after almost 30 years. This is not new. Yeah, it took them a while to get there, but they finally have it. And, you know, in my paper, I talk about even further back how a lot of studios did not like the idea of people renting videotapes. They wanted you to pay for that tape and then they didn't want you to own it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, you know, they, they, they wanted you to own it, but they wanted you to also keep buying more. And when you're renting, you're not buying anything. You're not paying them directly, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe they're getting a little bit out of that, but they're not getting as much as they wanted for when you actually paid like, you know, however much they were charging at the time for tapes. And uh, yeah, I think they that's exactly what they wanted. And it's crazy to see the trend over time and people not really catching on. And now no. people are starting to catch on because people are seeing that things are getting pulled and just disappearing. So it's like, very abrupt and very in your face. And I think that's probably why people are noticing now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we're, we're seeing it all laid out, but when it's actually happening in real time, it doesn't feel as jarring, No, I think. It, it seems to be something we're slowly at least understanding, if not accepting that 
you know, you have your Netflix subscription and these movies come this month and these movies go this month. And the, to me, the whole point of having media at home is that it's on your schedule when you want, whether that be this month, next year, 10 years from now, that's, that's why you invest in that equipment. When we were talking about tapes and the cost and the rental, for a while there, the, the studios thought that, well, we'll just sell tapes at a very large price and then we'll knock them down for consumers eventually. And then DVD came along and some genius figured out if we make these things cheap and the quality high, we'll sell a ton of them. And that was great. The studios at the same time hated it because they knew they had high quality copies that people didn't have to replace if they didn't want to. And you yeah, can almost I, see them say, I got to find another answer. Yeah, they're they're trying to work it out in their heads as how we can get people to pay more and us work less, <laughs> essentially. And another big thing that I think people are now just starting to realize, which is actually funny to me, because again, there's been many instances of it happening, is that these are becoming again you know they were they weren't for a while supposedly but because i talk about the paramount decree of 1948 and that you know studios owned every arm of making of filmmaking you know production distribution exhibition and they said well you have to give up one thing and they gave up exhibition that's you know a the theater isn't necessarily quote unquote as big and it's big in my opinion, obviously, because I go to movies all the time, but it's not thought of as like this big money-making entity anymore. And so they've just switched over to streaming. Streaming is their new exhibition. It's a virtual theater. That's what I see it as. And so now they're owning all three again, they're owning production, distribution, exhibition. And that is in, conflict with the paramount decree in my opinion and i've read some other articles that say that and so now they're monopolies again they're giant monopolies and people are now saying wow it's like they're controlling everything they're giant monopolies i'm like well yeah i am not a lawyer by any stretch of the imagination yeah. but it is my understanding that as of a year or two ago the paramount mm -hmm. decree was rendered null and void because they had actually gone through and looked at any law that didn't have a sunset clause. Mm -hmm. And and that was one of the ones that they said that they were just going to, and the logic was that the, the technology available now meant that the they would never be able to recreate the monopoly system they had in the 40s. Now, if I'm wrong on that, I'm sorry, but yeah. that I just recently had this discussion and this is fresh in my mind. Oh, no, you know, because, you know, I still read a lot about this stuff but because of my paper and that's the problem with my papers that I couldn't stop adding stuff because stuff was constant news was constantly coming out and you know at the rate that the news was coming out I would write like the paper would never be finished mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. because it's just non-stop especially because streaming just seems to get bigger and bigger and bigger um and yeah, I, I I find that interesting, though, that they're saying, well, it could never be the same. And I understand because it's like, you know, there's not any block booking. It's not exactly like a theater, but it is a form of exhibition. And so I still find it interesting that, well, they now also own exhibition to some extent. It may not be theaters and it may not be exactly what's written in the Paramount Decree, but they're still, now they're monopolies again, in some sense. I, I tend to agree with you. And my personal feeling is that if you own the only way I can see that movie, then that you basically do own the exhibition. If there was a time, because of the, what the Paramount Decree used to mean was that I could go see your movie, but I could go see it in a theater owned by one of 10 companies so that was not in your but if the only way i can see it is on your streaming service then that is functionally the same thing to me yeah yeah i agree and 
we're finding that now that especially, you know, streaming services are less becoming like general libraries and more just, this is stuff we have licensed and we own. And so it's only going to be on our streaming service. You can't find it on all these other platforms. And I'm finding that more and more each day when I'm trying to find a movie just on the Roku. And all of a sudden I have to pay for it on all these streaming services that I thought I had, you know, I thought I had access to that title. And if I were to just spitball here, I would say that generally speaking, the customer was better served by the iTunes Google model where you pay for a specific title and you could have different people offer this. I'm not saying just stick it to Apple mm -hmm. or Google, but, and then you get that title digitally streamed, owned, whatever, but you can go to somebody different each time, or you can pick your favorite, but to always have to go to a shared service, which is a subscription. And that's what always yeah. gets me. It's a monthly fee, whether you use it or not, you're not paying per title anymore. And that's, I think that really does the customer a disservice. I think so too, because at least for me, and I don't know about other people who like day to day use streaming services, but I'm always hunting for a specific title. Usually I'm not looking for, I don't engage with movies where I'm like, you know what? I don't only want to watch movies owned by Amazon. <laughs> So I'm going to subscribe to Amazon so I can only watch Amazon movies. At least for me and most people that I see on Twitter, film Twitter, they're looking for specific titles. And so I think that's why a lot of them actually buy physical media is because they're looking for a specific title and they're not looking to subscribe monthly to access all these other films that they don't know about. You know, if you are maybe adventurous and you're like, well, I'd like to explore this library by this one company or this one streaming service, then that would make sense, I guess. But I don't feel like that's how most people consume film at all. No, and if anything, the, the what you just described of going through a company's library or the way you pop up Netflix and it says, these are this is what's trending on Netflix now, that's an extension of what we used to call couch surfing where you would turn on the TV and you would just go up through the channel till something grabbed your interest. But we got away from that almost 15 years ago. It started off with the DVR and then it evolved into streaming. But we got away from the idea that you just passively looked and waited for something to come along. You said, I want to watch uh, Stranger Things. And you sat down and said, I'm going to watch Stranger Things. And when Stranger Things was done, you turned off the TV and you went and did something else. And that's a new thing it was, it, and I don't think enough people still want to couch surf to, to justify this model. Yeah, and because the whole idea with streaming is that we're getting away from cable. You mm -hmm. know, this is not cable. You know, they're really trying to separate themselves from that model. But I find that really interesting. What you just said is that it literally is couch surfing. And it's not, but it's not to me not as rewarding because like you said you watch that one thing you sit through it if you find something that catches your eye and then you're done you know but with the way these streaming services are set up you're supposed to like consume all of it at once it's like they call it binging you know mm -hmm. and maybe sure. i did that in some form on the on tv if there was a marathon right or something like that, like Twilight Zone Marathon is like something I could think of that I did binge, but they just want you to consume, 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 but it only be their product, mm -hmm. their library. Mm -hmm. And most people, like you said, don't look at a specific film company's library. You and I might in very specific circumstances because we're historians and we like to look at the art and the history of it, but that's not what you expect from the average consumer, nor would it be reasonable to even suggest it. People want at least a genre or, or an idea before they even sit down. And I think that's why more streaming services are trying to curate, right? Like you said, trending now, you know, that's some kind of form of curation, although I don't find it 
to be a very good curation (laughs) at all um yeah I don't think it's I I don't think and again the curation is like they're choosing it for you still you're being told what to watch and told here are your options pick one the ones that always make me cringe a little bit is the phrase suggested for you it's like okay you have this really expensive algorithm that clearly has no idea who I am because what you're suggesting is not something I have any interest in and would probably turn off in five minutes if I gave it a shot it's so true and I find it even on the free even on like streaming services that I love that are free like Tubi I'm a total Tubi advocate I love Tubi um but I swear to god they don't know what I'm watching at all because it's the most random movie that I would never ever watch never and I'm like Tubi what are you thinking mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, and I'm really not trying to be down on the streaming services as a whole and I don't think you are either because no. you just you just said you like Tubi and I'm you know I'm a big fan of Paramount Plus. I, I do and I I pay it and I get my money's worth out of it. And I actually do go and look deep into their library just because it's a very large historic library. But I really I really think that we're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater here and that we get this really convenient service and we're we have the assumption that this is all you need. Like, no, this is this should be maybe your first stop in finding a TV show or a movie but not your last. Yeah. I think it's, it's a way to like also limit your scope. If you're just, you know, because like cable, you know, they were trying to get away from cable and saying, look at these expensive cable prices. Look at these cable bills you're paying. Well, we're not going to have you pay that. We're going to have you subscribe and it's going to be like, you know, $9 a month and you're going to get all of this. Well, that was good at the beginning, you know, when they were more general libraries and weren't, you know, exclusively just films that they had licenses to, you know, I think that now you're not really getting your bang for your buck and you're not able to even track if you're getting your bang for your buck because when you're buying physical titles, you know, individually, or you're tracking how many movies you're watching on a service, you know, maybe that's a way to say, you know what, I am getting my money's worth. But I think a lot of people are just auto renew that subscription fee. And, you know, hopefully I'm getting what I'm paying for, but I don't actually know. Yeah. And it's very difficult. I mean, they have your usage data. So I'm not saying they don't know. Yeah. But at the same time, companies that will grab three or four different giant libraries like Amazon and Disney being some of the biggest offenders. And they're saying, well, we have all this content. Yes, but you're appealing to such a, you you really have no cohesive platform anymore. You don't have, you're not offering a cohesive product. You're just offering this large buffet that's indistinguishable from what cable used to be. Yeah, I definitely have seen it in my mind as a buffet. And it's a, you know, I'm like, well, I don't want to eat just this kind of food. I also want to eat this kind of food. Well, if I want to eat all this kind of food, I have to now pay all these little subscription fees. Mm -hmm. And it isn't just $9 anymore. I think, you know, in my thesis, which, you know, now those numbers have changed. But I think, you know, I was like, well, can right now maybe get upwards of 54 a month you know Mm -hmm. again that's not like a cable bill like right but it's getting there it is we're getting there (laughs) yeah yeah i strongly advocate if you're when you get the subscription services heavily audit what you really use and what you're what's really worth to you because it's the auto renewal is not worth it if you don't think you're going to use it every month don't have it Really, just just don't have it. You can always come back to it. They will take your money in February if they don't take it in December. It's, it's okay. They're okay with that. Yeah, and they also like, oh my God, when I I'm so, I subscribe to Disney Plus for work mm-hmm. so I could, you know, have access to some of the media that we're running for um, classes. I got so many emails from them when I like unsubscribed after a month. They're like, are you sure? Are you sure? It was like five, it was like crazy that they're, and I'm like, 
wow, this is really <laughs> aggressive targeting to mm -hmm. get me to get back on the service because they're trying to compete with all these other services now. You know, at first it wasn't this huge competition game. A lot of them were like, oh, I got in, you know, people are subscribing, I'm getting some money. But now they're like, wait a minute, there's, you know, uh, Paramount Plus, there's, I mean, I don't even think Sony, does Sony have a streaming service? I guess they have. Uh, there's, I think they were bought by somebody else or yeah. their service was, I should say. I don't even remember yeah. who. They, you know, all these other studios are looking at each other like, well, now I have to compete with all these other studio services when it was just me at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I'm always wondering like how aggressive they're trying to target people who give up subscriptions based on like the competition i'm sure they have enough money i mean they're giant companies but i'm always wondering right. like how they're trying to improve their their you know uh usage like how many subscribers they have sure and they might be giant companies but at the same time some of these services were so expensive to boost and then start up that no matter how much money they have coming in, it could be years till they see that investment back. And that's the same as being dirt poor in some cases. It is. And I think like some of them are now realizing that a lot of that monthly subscription that they're getting is not enough. It's mm -hmm. not enough to like, like they're not making money. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if it's going to last. Like, I think, I don't know if they realize, like you said, right, it's like the payoff is kind of way down the road. Mm -hmm. But I, I think they're now realizing like, we're not really getting a lot of money from these services because they're not getting residuals. They're not getting royalties. It's like monthly subscription. That's it. You know, I'm not. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's crazy. You know, I give, I don't subscribe to Disney at the moment, but you know, I could give them my 10 bucks a month. And whether I watch one Star Wars show or 20, they're still getting 10 bucks a month for me. If yeah. only there was some way they could sell me that specific show on a little shiny thing they could ship to my house, I might give them more money for that. How about that for a concept? No, because that would mean they're giving up control. Right. And that, heaven forbid that, because, you know, I don't pay for that. That that's that's not money that I would be willing to shell out if for a little bit of control in my life. It's like they they now have to choose: mm, do we make more money, or do we allow people to own things again? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not sure. Right, and you know, if you go into any room in my house, you can see that I have spent no small amount of money on Star Wars stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's not like this is something that they can't talk me into here. Why don't I just don't get it. It's I understand they have to control their product, but if I don't want it, their product isn't worth anything. I'm going to be honest. I don't think they get it. OK, <laughs> I like that. I don't think they get it again. Like I said, I don't think they realize that they're not they're not getting their bang for their buck. <laughs> and I think maybe they're slowly realizing it, but. I think it's going to take them a while to realize, hey, actually, we were making more money when we were charging people for like individual titles, as opposed to, you know, paying one, f one fee for all these films. Yeah. And like I kind of said earlier, it took them the better part of 25 years to figure out they made more money with cheap DVDs and expensive VHS tapes. And that I, that really isn't a reason they should have taken that long, but they're just stubborn and in some ways dumb. Do you think they'll, it'll, how long do you think it'll take uh, them to realize maybe they're not making as much money or do you think they even care at this point really? I think they might care if the biggest players weren't who they were. But the fact that we now have Disney and Netflix and Amazon in this three-way bear fight, and they all own so much, I don't think they're good at counting the little things anymore. I think that that's where they're really losing the plot is that they don't want to sit and say, well, what if we just did less and charge the reasonable? That, that's not their game plan. Disney's all about hotels that cost five grand a night. And Netflix, it, 
people don't realize they basically invented the Roku for this reason. They were going in this direction. Uh, and Amazon is, I mean, they're in the spaceship business now. They're, they're not into counting $3 DVD rentals. Yeah, I think that's a good point too, because I don't know if the, this has gone, this like graphic or illustration has gone around and, you know, I'll, I'll try to find it maybe for the show notes if, if it's helpful, but um, there's that graphic of what Disney owns and it's like in the shape of uh, Mickey's head. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's it's really frightening actually for me to even see like what all of these companies own and they don't even like know what they own sometimes mm-hmm. and it's like the same thing with libraries like um when disney bought 20th century fox i'm like i kind of just sat there and i was like i don't even think they know or care what they uh, now own you know, like mm-hmm. I'm watching 20th Century Fox films. I, I went to, there's this festival called Cinecon in um, Los Angeles where it's really hard to find titles, like really obscure. Um, and that's why I go because I'm not going to be able to see it any other way. And I'm going to see it in this historic theater and sometimes on nitrate. And I've seen like some of the best films at that, at that show on nitrate owned by 20th century fox and i'm like i don't even think disney knows or cares that they own this film and i will never be able to see this again the only way i could see it was on nitrate a flammable film stock i might not ever see this like on even a streaming service because they don't care that's tragic it really is i I mean just my heart so much it hurts my heart so much Uh (laughs) I mean, you, you, a Disney buys something like a Fox and they're looking at the top 10% of what that company owns and they might like take the next 20% and give it to the interns to play with it for a little bit. And, you know, if you can make this something sellable, that's fine. But like 70% of what they have historically is going to get sat on. And if that was owned by a smaller company, they would have the incentive to go deep into the library and say, okay, how can we take this thing and make something out of it? Yeah, and I think it's difficult because there's not those people, who, the, the people who are working there are not the advocates for those titles. And I think like it takes people who have a perspective and frame of mind to be able to market those films and give them like the light and like access uh, or not access, but the, um, the, uh, exposure that they deserve and I don't think those people are working at those companies to be honest like there's this I use this as an example but there's this film that I saw on on nitrate at the Egyptian theater in Los Angeles at the at Cinecon called it's great to be alive and it's this crazy wacky sci-fi musical film from like 19 I might be saying the year wrong but 1933 and it's about this millionaire who's like a gigolo and he gets in a plane after having a fight with his fiance and he basically they presume he dies in this plane crash and fast forward to the future there's this virus that has killed all the men and it's all women And it's this crazy film where it's like women president, women gangsters, women everything. I've never seen anything like this in like a 1930s film. And this could be marketable. Mm -hmm. It so could be, I could see it in my head how it could be marketable and how it could be sold on disc and how it could be even put on a streaming service. But it'll probably never, ever see the light of day. I'm hurt. And there, the, that whole era, like 1935 and prior, there were mm-hmm. so many experimental movies that came out. And that was just at that magic point where sound was affordable and movies were getting longer, but the code hadn't really kicked in to make say you can't do this and that. It's like, and, and there's so many bangers in that era that just aren't getting preserved because there's not the focus on it from the commercial end. Yeah. And, you know, I think in the 30s especially because there's all those 
you know, and I think people can easily dismiss them because it was, especially, you know, 1930, they were still figuring sound out. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of films that come off maybe to a modern audience and who knows, maybe it came off that way back then that are clunky and (laughs) very, you know, stagnant but that's because they're figuring it out right, and i just right. find those films so interesting because they are like time capsules even if they weren't meant to be time capsules it's like watch these things watching these people fumble and try to figure out sound and trying to figure out blocking and where to put people like i feel like that should be at least looked at as being like culturally historically important but i don't think it will be and that's so sad to me it really is Film is the closest we can get to a literal time machine. Yes, yes, yes. It, 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 because you can, there are so many things that get captured accidentally that people don't realize they're getting it when they get it. That, that when you go back and look, it's like, oh, wow, this is, you have this really vivid idea of what it was like to be on that set, on that street, in that museum at that exact moment in time. Are you, go ahead, sorry. It's so true. It's so true. Like, one phenomena that I only figured out about because it was on disc and it's not, you know, it's like one of Warner Brothers, like kind of earlier discs um, when they were starting to kind of release those 1930s, 20s films on DVD for the first time. My mentor who does home video restoration and he's been projecting for 50 years now. And that's crazy to me. Oh my God, he's so amazing. Uh, he was telling me, I'm watching these you know, early 1929, 1930 films on disc. And I've noticed something really odd. He was like, I've noticed that there's these pauses that these actors are doing. Like, it's almost like they're waiting for someone to say cut. Like they're holding their expression Uh and they're holding their, you know, whatever line they just said, and they're just waiting for a cue. And one of the discs, and I can't quite remember the film, but it has Norma Shearer and Marie Dressler in it. There's this scene where they're holding, they're just sitting there. They said the line, you know, they, they're, the scene is done. And all of a sudden you just see this shot of, someone fluffing a pillow and then Norma Shear sitting down. So you see a producer literally fluffing the pillow and she's sitting down and you also see them just waiting for a cue from someone. And it's like, that was not meant, I'm sure that wasn't meant to be put on the disc and be in like the cut, Mm -hmm. you know, for whoever released it. I'm sure that would be something they would immediately want to swipe just like they removed changeover cues. But this is like something like that you wouldn't normally ever see. And it's just on this one DVD at this video store that we just happen to see. Like that's that, crazy to me. I love that. I lo- Are you familiar with the work of Edward LaRusso? Vaguely. Okay. I mean, if you didn't, I would introduce you in a hurry because this is exactly up your alley. I've sponsored a bunch of his projects. I'm a big fan. Just making sure you personally knew about this guy. Um, yeah, can you give me like a quick rundown? Just yes, to... he uh, is in the business of restoring old, mostly silent films. There's a few sounds mm-hmm. in there as well. But he goes to the Library of Congress or gets them from a private collector, restores mm-hmm. them, and then makes them available for as for his digital downloads or on DVD or Blu-ray, most mm-hmm. often through Kickstarter. That and is he's, amazing. He's done it a bunch of times. I have a lot of his work. It's all very, very high quality. I can't recommend it highly enough. And here's the thing that sells me completely. Not only are you getting something that isn't seen anywhere else, he's mm-hmm. doing it legally, 100% legally, because a lot of it's in public domain at this point. You just have oh, to yeah. figure out where to get it from. And he's charging what you would charge for any DVD at Walmart. I, yeah. I mean, you're getting a DVD of a rare silent film for 20 bucks 25 for a blu-ray if yeah. you just get the download it's like 15 it's like it's incredibly affordable and he gets a professional music score that usually either incorporates the Amazing. original music score or reasonably in- extrapolates from what it would have been hey I'll, I'll send you the link later on 
Yeah, I mean, that is, to me, a saint. <laughs> yes, yes. He truly like, appreciates what he's doing, and he's making it available for everybody at an extremely attractive price. Yeah, exactly. That's what I, when you are describing him, I just see, I just hear, like, availability, access. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, that's what it should be. He's not charging an arm and a leg. Saying, you know, it's he sounds very humble. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he's literally doing this because this is his passion, and he wants he wants other like minded people who are also passionate about what he's seeing and doing to have access to that. Mm -hmm. And I just I I love people like that. I wish there were more people like that. Yes, with film being as big as it is and everybody talks about how it's this giant giant industry it's like you can't tell me there aren't people who look at the history of it and say this is worth preserving there's so many little people out there who are working on things like that projects like that you know kickstarters gofundmes you know and grassrootsing it you know where they're they're trying to raise the money and they just want people to have access they want the film that they're restoring to get the notoriety that it deserves to get people to appreciate it. Even if those directors are, and I've said this before, like, I don't care if the directors are alive, dead, you know, they've been dead for maybe a hundred years. I don't care. Like, I feel like every film deserves some appreciation and some buddy to be able to access it and enjoy it. And not only that, I agree completely with whatever you just said. I, I do. But we are in a time now where there is nobody alive who remembers the world before film. That This has been our whole life. The oldest person on the planet remembers going to the movies. So this is a part of our lives that we need to understand and know where it came from and where it's going. Yeah, and I think the comforting thing for me about writing my thesis is because I and just history in general, is that you can trace what's happening and watch it unfold. And I think like the scary thing is with streaming, you know, I can make as many guesses or assumptions of what is going to happen and what the future is going to be, but I don't know, um, you know, especially with how the world has been the last few years, I don't have any idea of what might happen you know what's next after streaming people keep asking that question you know I think streaming it right now is a little stagnant mm -hmm. I don't know what's gonna I, I just wonder what's gonna happen if I had to guess and I don't like to mm -hmm. do that but yeah. I would say the next big development is not going to be technological it's going to be social Mm -hmm. is that and by social i mean it's going to be a mix of what the customers want and what the industry is willing to provide is that we're going to say this cable 2.0 model isn't what we want we want either this and another choice or we want to split this up or get more control over individual titles we i really think that there's going to be a point at which people say this needs to be something better yeah, I think people are already slowly beginning to say it. I think, you know, I don't know if, because I'm, I'm, you know, this isn't a huge, cons I haven't been taking like a consensus of everybody's feelings about it, but I think, like I said, the jarringness of people seeing things disappear, so new shows at least disappear right in front of them. I think they're already starting to realize this isn't actually what I wanted to sign up for. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, yeah, I wonder if people are going to kind of go with that and advocate for something better, or if they're kind of just going to be like, oh, well, and then, you know, more is going to have more similar things like that are going to happen. And then it's just going to get to a boiling point. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, it is, it's crazy, you know, cable, going from cable, but then like they have stuff like, um, I'm trying to think of those packages that they do, like you, what is it, Sling? Or um, try to think of those where they're like, buy this and then you have access to these cable channels or these live TV channels 
they don't even call it cable really they call it live tv i guess mm-hmm. um where it's packages but i'm like this is just like cable you guys yeah and this the reason like- we got away from it is that yeah. it just wasn't delivering what we wanted anymore which slowly but surely the bigger streaming services are getting to that point i i really think that if i had to design it you'd have a lot of very small people with very small libraries offering small chunks of what they have online. You'd have almost individual studios or artists starting to offer their content as opposed to the giant package. Yeah, the package just gets really confusing. And again, it's a way for me to not be able, at least me, you know, I have a hard time keeping track of everything in my life, Mm -hmm. let alone like what I've consumed in terms of film and television. So to me, the packages are just even more confusing. Yeah, I I would, for as the foreseeable future, I can see I will continue to pay the monthly fee for Paramount mm-hmm. Plus because mm-hmm. there are a lot of things I watch on there and just getting it all in one time to- makes sense to me. But if you were to say to me, would you pay $2 to see The Mandalorian per episode? I'd be like, yeah, that makes more mm-hmm. sense to me because I yeah. don't think I'll go do the deep dive into the Disney stuff. Even though I did it one time, I wouldn't anymore. And I can make that choice for myself. And I think having that flexibility is probably the next reasonable step. Yeah, I think as of right now, I don't subscribe to any monthly like streaming service. And I'm not saying that is like a proud, you know, give me my cookie or my Mm -hmm. trophy. I just, I had, I hit a point where I was subscribed to at least two or three. And I was like, I'm not doing deep dives on these streaming platforms, you know, again, I'm doing the, I'm seeking out one individual title and it was never, ever on any of those streaming, like it never happened to be on those streaming services that I was subscribed to. And so I just had to quit it all Mm -hmm. because it was just too much to keep track of. And so that's why I like to be, um, again, to be advocate because it's free. (laughs) Mm-hmm. and people I think are so they I feel like people now have adverse reactions to um commercials because they're trying to get away from cable they wanted to get away from cable to get away from commercials and some people pay those you know extra subscription prices to avoid commercials but you know what I will sit through a commercial to get you that know- free content I was actually just about to say something very similar is that I am no fan of commercials, but I think it's great to have the flexibility of whether you want to pay less and see them or more and not. I I can't imagine having that choice as being a bad thing in any stretch. It's still making more content available. It's still putting it in the hands of people that want it. Because let's be honest here. There are people that are going to love a whole bunch of things that may not be able to afford paying for them. That's why commercial TV became a thing in the first place. You get sponsors to pay for the content. I'm not against that model. I just want people to be able to choose it. Yeah, exactly. I'm all about choice. And that's why, you know, I chose to unsubscribe to all those streaming services and I can choose to subscribe to them if I want to, or choose to subscribe to a streaming service that has no commercials or pay that little extra to have no commercials. I think for me and the way I consume stuff, Tubi is good. Archi- Internet archive is good enough mm-hmm. for me right now because I just have very specific viewing patterns and I should not be paying for any streaming service uh, because I just... Don't, I it is so irresponsible for me to do at the moment. I just I consume things in such a uh, frantic, not organized way that <laughs> I would doing my be doing myself a disservice <laughs> to pay money. I love going in the Internet Archive, downloading a bunch of stuff on a USB drive, and slapping it to the big screen. Mm-hmm. And all I have to ask is why haven't they taken the next step and made their own streaming service? I've literally been thinking that my like for so long because there's so much stuff on there that like I've I've never found anywhere else 
and I just don't want to watch. I have attention problems. I don't want to watch it on my tiny computer web browser. Um, I, yeah, please, Internet Archive, please, like. You've got someday. my support if you ever do it, for sure. I know, right? I'm totally, I will sign that petition. I will donate that that money to make that happen. Well, Amelia, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I'm really enjoying this chat. And there's a whole bunch more I think we could cover. But I oh, want to yeah. make sure I get a chance to plug what you're doing here. So I'm going to link your Twitter profile and your thesis in the show notes. Where else can people find your adventures on the web? So, you know, I'm primarily on Twitter, but I also use Instagram. It's the same uh, name uh, because I am not creative and I like to have everything be the same. So, yeah, I'm on Instagram. I post a lot of film frame images or film stuff on there. Uh, those are my primarily two social media platforms where I like post the most film related stuff at the moment. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for doing this and I will send you those links. Please send me what you got and we will do this again sometime soon, hopefully. We'll have to do it again. We have so much to talk about. We do, we do. Yeah.